Welcome to the Metaphoricist Magazine podcast, your home for beautifully made speculative fiction. The magazine is edited by B. Morris Allen, and I'm your host, Matt Gomez. This week's story is Snow Like Pink Pepper by Devin Barlow. Devin Barlow writes short fiction, poetry, and novels. When not writing, she reads voraciously, drinks tea, and thinks about fairy tales and sea monsters. Find her online at devinbarlow.com or on Twitter at devin underscore barlow. That's D-E-V-A-N underscore B-A-R-L-O-W. Let's jump in. It was almost sunset when Albie first saw the girl who understood the snows. Albie was heading back to the Sinishal headquarters after her rounds purifying drinking water for the neighborhoods on the city's northern edge. She was running later than she liked, preferring to be back inside before sunset brought with it the risk of flurries, but had been slowed down by a collapsed wagon blocking the streets. And, she admitted to herself, her stride had slowed in the decades she'd served as a Sinishal. At first she assumed that the girl, who stood on the front stoop of a small house, face tilted upward as if waiting for the snow to begin, was one of the many who illicitly gathered snow to produce extracts. Except the girl had none of the usual equipment, nothing in her hands at all. She was just waiting, though shelter and safety were near. A spot of light in Albie's peripheral vision confirmed she was running even later than she thought. The sun was setting, and faint flakes were beginning to descend. Snows only fell at night. She swore and picked up her pace, only to realize the girl hadn't budged. A thought flared faintly in Albie's mind, and she looked around, conscious of faces at windows. This was too public, even if her guess was right. Some part of her recognized that this might be a foolish idea, relying on the logic of children's stories she hadn't thought about in years, but she didn't give herself time to consider that. With a nervous glance upward, she asked in a soft voice, What are you waiting for? The girl flinched, startled by Albie's voice, and placed a hand on the knob of the front door as if to flee inside. Yet just then, a dusting of snowflakes landed on the girl's shoulders, and her posture relaxed. I know what you are, Albie said, though she only half believed it herself. And then, before the girl could duck inside, she named a place and a time. And now here the two of them were, the girl looking grimly reluctant. She had admitted only her first name, Callie, though surely she had known that Albie, a seneschal, could easily learn more about her family. Finest snow drink this side of the city. The bartender winked as she placed empty glasses in front of them both. Though the place was packed, the two of them might have been the only customers who mattered. Dozens of bottles rested on the shelves behind the bartender, whose practiced hands flew from shelf to shelf collecting ingredients. Albie had seen the look that had passed between the bartender and the guard at the door. They seemed afraid that Albie might be the rare seneschal who dragged themselves out to such establishments for the purpose of actually enforcing the rules regarding seneschal-approved snow extracts, rather than to partake themselves. Albie had opted for a plain warm jacket instead of full seneschal dress, though she had still allowed the bartender to spot her ring. Why? Was she trying to show off for Callie? Hoping to distract herself from how foolish this made her feel, she let the sounds of the bar drift through her mind, pinpointing the other occupants. Two men were at a corner table, too caught up in one another to notice anyone else. On the other side of the room, a woman in a coat simple enough to be horrendously expensive sat with a figure too wrapped in furs to distinguish, their voice muffled. Albie guessed a merchant, meeting with a client or trader maybe even the same merchant who sold snow extracts to this establishment. Albie didn't think any of the other customers were the arch seneschal's spies, but she kept her voice low anyway. Berry wine, the bartender explained as she hoisted a bottle full of pink and orange liquid like captured sunrise. I can only get a few bottles of this every year. A design pressed into the glass, a bee surrounded by birds, caught the candlelight. From the eastern provinces, beyond the mountain pass. Not one of the finer producers, though Albie didn't inform the bartender. She hadn't chosen this place for the quality of its wares. 
And finally, the bartender was clearly caught between wanting to show off her fanciest drink and hoping Albie wasn't planning to scrutinize her storeroom too closely. Most every establishment cut costs by buying from unlicensed snow gatherers, at least until those particular gatherers died or were caught. She pulled down a glass jar, its sides frosted to conceal the contents, and whispered an unlocking spell. Such valuable ingredients couldn't otherwise be so openly displayed. The blue substance inside the jar was the color of the sky when the sun came out to fool everyone into thinking they were safe. Snow only fell at night in this city. Albie heard Callie's surprise in the breath she tried concealing. As the bartender scooped out mounds of the stuff with a spoon that had seen better days, Callie leaned closer, eyes searching as if to count the individual blue grains. Callie knew there was more to the snows than how they could harm and how they could intoxicate, even if no one else seemed to care, even if she had never dared to tell anyone else what she knew. The snows of the city, resonating with the effects of long-ago magics, were endlessly dangerous. More than a few minutes' exposure during snowfall almost certainly meant harm to humans, if not death. Even once they were rendered temporarily inert by daylight, careless extraction could still prove toxic, before the proper, seneschal approved process rendered the snows down into something luxurious. The snows were also endlessly different, varying in color, shape, an effect based on where in the city they fell. Callie had been only seven the first time she met a snow creature, young enough that her parents almost managed to convince her the meeting never happened. She'd taken advantage of a moment they were both distracted to linger outside as night began falling, and had seen the way the flakes collected on ground and rooftops and branches, coalescing into shapes that made her think of living creatures. Suddenly, a curious sound had tugged at her hearing, and snowflakes swirled together into the shape of something winged, perhaps a butterfly. Though the creature had no obvious eyes, Callie was struck by the sense of it watching her. What is your name? Callie had asked, her lips cold enough to mangle the syllables. The snow creature seemed to understand, wings moving rapidly and its outlines solidifying more than they had before. A few snowflakes landed on Callie's face. She slowly stuck out her tongue, daring to taste the cold shape hovering on her upper lip. Callie! Suddenly, hands wrenched her backwards, and she lost the snowflake. She heard harsh curses and was startled to turn and find her father. She had never heard him speak in such a way. You must not heed the voices of the snows, he said once they were inside, his voice still strange to her. Do you know how fast a snow creature can smother you? She was taught, in no uncertain terms, that the snows were deadliest when they coalesced into shapes, when the magic of individual flakes combined and strengthened the snow's already damaging effects. You must not heed the voices of the snows. The words followed her through life, yet every time the skies opened up, Callie heard a cacophony of pleas she could never quite fit into the words of her own vocabulary. Everyone was all too ready to recount to her the horror of the city's snows. While they had originally been summoned by the Seneschals to defend the city, they had quickly overpowered both the Seneschals and the rest of the inhabitants. Callie had grown up trying to hide her fascination with the snows, trying to convince herself that she didn't notice the sense of dislocation between herself and everyone she spoke to, that she didn't notice the odd looks or cruel amusement that were sometimes directed her way. But no matter what she told herself when she was around other people, she always sensed the truth when she was alone. Whenever she dared, and was alone, she would linger outside for a few moments longer than she knew she should, and let the snows fall on her. Because that first day, she had almost known the snow creature's name, and every time after that, she sensed she was getting closer and closer to understanding them. Closer and closer to someone who might finally understand her. Albie tilted her head back as the blue snow extract hit the orange-pink of the berry wine, and a cloudy smoke rose from the liquid's undulating surface, smelling of burnt rosemary and salt water. Best to keep her mind clear. Callie, though, let the smoke waft toward her, and closed her eyes in something like contentment. Good. Sharp edges wouldn't help Albie's cause. 
The girl took a sip of her drink, then said, What do you want? Albie took a sip of hers and felt the rush of snow extract, both an assault and a caress of the taste buds. The snow was rare, more so than she'd expected in a place like this. Her eyes closed briefly before she forced them back open, fighting the ingredient's strength. When Albie lowered her glass, she found Callie still staring at her. The girl seemed unaffected by the drink. Surely someone of her age, which Albie judged no more than twenty, and status couldn't have had much exposure to snow drinks, yet she appeared no more affected than she would be by plain sinishal purified water. Albie had made what inquiry she could without alerting any other sinishals. This girl was one of many who had inherited the burden of anchoring the city's magic merely by being born here, one of many who would almost certainly never leave. Callie took another sip. Her eyes closed, evincing that same hint of pleasure, but when her eyes opened again, they were just as sharp. Albie was even more sure she had found the right person. We have a proposition for you, Albie said, resisting the urge to have more of her drink, though it rippled temptingly in the confines of her glass. We? Something in the girl's face made it seem like she knew Albie was working alone. That couldn't be true. The order of Seneschals. The bartender had swung back to their end of the bar to grab something from a high shelf. Just close enough, Albie saw her twitch at the name. I can't think why. The girl was calm, but not the calm of the snow intoxicated. Because the snows won't hurt you the way they do the rest of us. Callie met her eyes for a few heartbeats, then picked up her drink, downed the remaining two-thirds, and slid off her chair. Without another word, she made for the exit. Albie tossed a voucher at the bartender, which she could bring to the order for reimbursement if whoever staffed the window that day was in a good mood, and took off in the same direction. She didn't finish her drink. The first snow Callie had ever tasted, on that day when it fell without hurting her at all, reminded her of pink pepper. She had tasted pink pepper only once before, when her family had gone for a fancy meal after an unusually prosperous season at their workshop. The final course of the night was chocolate, squares dark and bitter, topped with a few finely ground pieces of pink pepper. Callie soon realized no one else but her was listening to the snow. They spoke. They had stories to tell, and pains they wish healed. But to everyone else, snows were dangerous, deadly, things that burned through your skin or paralyzed you or stopped your heart. Numerous variations in color and shape and viscosity, all ending in one version or another of pain and death. They would all taste different, she knew in her heart, a multitude of flavors. Whenever the snow she thought of as pink pepper fell, she found it hard to move from the window, that layer of glass keeping her from something almost a friend. Callie's world was full of whispers, the ones from the sky she wasn't allowed to answer and the ones from people who saw a strangeness in her, who pushed her away even as she yearned to feel less alone. The difference was, the whispers that fell from the sky had started, slowly, over the years, to make sense. By the time Albie reached the street outside the bar, Callie was already disappearing around a corner. Albie fought her way through the increasingly busy late afternoon foot traffic, elbows out to clear her way, ignoring the occasional shout of dismay this produced. Despite her own good sense, she hadn't been able to keep from building up a picture of Callie in her mind during the time between their first encounter and their meeting at the bar. Like everyone in the city, Albie had grown up hearing the fables of people who could talk to the snow, who didn't have to be afraid of being stuck outside at night. Before meeting Callie, however, Albie thought she had long since dismissed those fables. She was unwilling to examine what it meant that she now grasped at this possibility so frantically. She had hoped, many years ago, that if she ever managed to claw her way up the ranks of the Seneschals, she would be able to get out of the city. But all this time later, after having so clawed, achieving everything but the rank of Arch Seneschal itself, she knew the truth. The Seneschals were as frozen, as stuck in the city where the sky could kill, as everyone else they pretended to be better than. Now, though, she had a plan. If, 
and she once again forced herself to remember it was only an if. If Callie could communicate with the Snows, and more importantly, if Alby drew her into her orbit before any other seneschals got the chance, it could be Alby's ticket out of the city. Snow extracts were the city's most profitable export, but the work was complicated and dangerous enough that few were able to meet the standards required for the seneschal's stamp of approval, and most of those who made extracts illicitly didn't live long. If Callie could understand the snows, then with Albie's guidance they could produce the snow extracts faster and more safely than anyone else in the city, and Albie was willing to bet she'd find herself with more friends once those profits started coming in. Friends who could help her manage the treacherous, expensive passage out of the city. Once she and the girl had worked out a process, she shouldn't have to actually be in this awful place where she always had to be afraid of the weather, at least not often. She suspected Callie would insist on a large share of the profits, but since she didn't seem to have any reason to leave the city herself, Albie thought it would work. Will it snow tonight? Albie asked when she finally caught up to Callie, three streets away from the bar. Callie stilled. Your order still doesn't know anything about me, she said, looking off into the distance as if waiting to see the first flakes descend. They'd lock me up if they did. I can arrange that. Then why haven't you? Albie refrained from answering. Callie's gaze shifted minutely. So why are you here? Because you're not afraid of the snows. I saw you, Albie said. Don't you understand how important that is? We turn them into drinks, Callie snapped. The snows hurt us because that's what they were created to do, to wreak havoc on anyone who tried taking the city. But now they're just stuck here like us. They're hurting. But people refuse to listen. Everyone here only cares about processing the snows. She folded her lips inward as if to take back her words. Albie saw her chance. Then help me prove it. She had to stop herself from grabbing the girl's arms and shaking her into agreeing. Callie didn't seem to realize what her gift could mean. But if Albie could get to her through her concerns for the snows. Callie stared back at her, wary. The Order doesn't understand, Albie said, keeping her voice low. You could never be sure there wasn't another Seneschal watching, and the Arch Seneschal would be thrilled by the merest hint of Albie conspiring against the Order. Help me prove to them what the Snows are going through. Albie wasn't sure if there was a way of gathering extracts that the Snows themselves would consider acceptable, but she would worry about that later. Yet before she could see whether Callie believed her or not, the air thickened suddenly. Callie looked up, her mouth open as if to speak to the sky. She paused, looking back to Albie. The older woman saw the calculation in the girl's eyes, but was discomfited to realize she didn't know what it was leading toward. They'll only pillage them more, Callie said. That's all they want, is to take and take and take. There was heat in her words, enough that Albie imagined the heaps of snow around them melting, flooding the city with the force of Callie's emotion. If we could all stop hurting each other and listen. Then make them understand, Albie countered, forcing confidence into her voice even though she feared the night's approaching snowfall. She wasn't certain she believed Callie's claims about the snow's pain, but as usual, Albie's pragmatism won out. She could play along with Callie's imaginings if it meant getting her on Albie's side. Besides, Callie might not be so concerned about the snows once the money started coming in. We can develop a system that doesn't hurt the snows and save some human lives too. Everyone wins. Callie regarded her for a long moment, every one of Albie's heartbeats like a warning of the pain that would soon descend on them. Would she burn here, waiting for an answer? Finally, Callie spoke. Here's what I need. The next night, the Seneschals were arrayed in front of the Order's main building. Above were the carefully constructed and warded arches of the canopy, a confection of glass doming over their heads, giving sight of the snows they thought they understood. Callie had requested this hour for her demonstration, as night fell and the first flakes of snow drifted down. She'd insisted to Albie that this would allow the Seneschals to understand the need to listen to the snow. It hadn't taken long for the others to hear about the demonstration, 
especially after Albie had encouraged her supporters to spread the news. The girl was walking past the arch, the last protected area from which a seneschal could stand and look out at the city. Albie watched as snow landed on Callie. The girl didn't even cringe, and soon she was enfolded in fluttering flakes, swirling around her and hinting at recognizable shapes. Moments passed, and Callie neither returned nor screamed out in pain. The air swished and swirled as the other seneschals bristled and consulted, a small knot of fury springing from the confusion they didn't want to admit to. What if she doesn't come back? For the first time, it occurred to Albie that she might have underestimated this strange girl. She glanced at the arch seneschal, a man with many decades carved into his face. She wasn't far behind him in years, but they had never gotten along. Did he know the plans she'd made and discarded? to unseat him once she'd realized even his position wouldn't get her what she wanted. He met her gaze accidentally, shoulders straightening as he wrapped his outermost layer more tightly around himself. Albie smiled, although seeing him disconcerted wasn't as satisfying as she usually found it. He shivered, breaking the connection, as disapproval sculpted his features. They were all frozen in their way, kept within these walls as much as the snow creatures were once the sun turned them motionless. She returned to watching Callie as unease prickled on the back of her neck like stray snowflakes, reminding herself fiercely that she was safely under the canopy. She still only just managed to stop herself from squirming. She had convinced herself she might have found a way to escape. But had she, who had told so many lies so successfully over the years, been convinced of an even more dire delusion? She'd thought Callie hadn't seen through her motives, didn't realize Albie didn't care about the snow's well-being, but if Callie had played her. Albie saw her plan crumbling, saw herself frozen within the city for decades more. No. Albie lunged forward from under the canopy, trailed by the other seneschal's exclamations. She could not stay here any longer. Maybe the snows would speak to her as they spoke to Callie. Maybe all she had to do was trust in this fable a little further, a little more strongly, and she could build her own escape from these terrifying snowflakes. And if she couldn't, either way, she was destined to freeze. Callie opened her mouth, letting a few stray flakes land on her lower lip. Each one was a cold pinpoint, but no more than that, doing no actual damage. By the time the seneschals realized why Callie had asked for this, it would be too late. She hoped. The snows would already be speaking through her, and then maybe, maybe, the seneschals would listen. Her conversation with Albie had crystallized Callie's conviction that she didn't want to hide what she could do, what she understood anymore. Didn't want to continue feeling separated from absolutely everyone, snow and human alike. She thought she saw a face an expression buried beneath the chill and the patterns, endlessly replicated as the sky drifted down. The world swirled until she lost track of up and down and left and right, only floating in the surge of snowflakes. A touch. Was it a hand reaching for her? Her throat was dry, here in this deluge of frozen water. She took a step forward, but could no longer tell if the ground remained steady under her feet. The world moved, or she did, or nothing changed at all. But then the face was closer, a question evident in the compilation of the snowflakes. Up and down and everywhere was the same, but she reached out, felt her hands shape themselves around delicate, fluttering wings. The snow creature's name was hard to understand still. That would come in time. She tasted pink pepper and heard a voice both familiar and new, speaking from her own throat. That was Snow Like Pink Pepper by Devin Barlow. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen to us on. Or, better yet, share the magazine and podcast with a friend. If you'd like to listen to more speculative fiction, Visit us online at magazine.metaphoricist.com or on Twitter at Metaphoricist Mag.